In my last video, I included a voice line by none other than Nouvellet that appears to spoil the ending of the Fontaine Arkan quests. Here, have a listen. Now that I have reclaimed one of the seven authorities from the hands of the usurpers, I have regained my true form. I am now a fully-fledged dragon, powerful enough to judge the rest of the gods. My final destiny is to judge the usurper king in the heavens above. But until that time comes, I will lend my power to you. You can see why I believe this tells us a lot about how the story will end, right? Nouvellet claims to have recovered his power, meaning he is in possession of the Hydronosis. He also quite literally promises to go to war against the Primordial One. Yet, what I didn't realize is how much his voice line has divided the lore community. While a lot of people take it at face value, many others believe we really shouldn't put too much stock into it. And I saw several comments that raised very valid points. Like, why should we believe Nouvellet will fight Celestia when he is just one Dragon Sovereign? All of them were vanquished when they were in possession of their full power, after all. He stands no chance. And if we can trust the war part, why trust the noses part? And should we even take any Ascension voice lines seriously at all? Hoyu is very ingenious about how to design their game, with a lot of gameplay mechanics fitting into the lore or being directly affected by it. But realistically, it is impossible to make every single mechanic lore accurate. One good example are the Traveler's Traveling Companions. I still think there is a lore-abiding explanation for this one that just hasn't been revealed yet, but I digress. The point is, according to the canon story, none of the characters we meet leave their lives behind to go adventuring with the Traveler. Yet we can pull for their Stella Fortuna and have them join the party. From there, we get access to all of these voice lines that all imply that said character and the Traveler are, indeed, adventuring together. So, technically, none of those should be canon. It's the same for the teapot voice lines. And yet, many such lines are verifiably true. The only ones that we really cannot test yet are the Ascension ones. If characters joining the Traveler's party isn't exactly canon, them ascending surely isn't. At no point in the story do we see allergens become more powerful progressively and naturally, nor do we see them reaching their final stage of ascension, because you would think that means they would ascend to Celestia, much like Vanessa did. So, are they fake? Well, no. Rather, I think they are what-ifs. The natural conclusions if all of these allergens were allowed to ascend. A possibility that the future holds, if you will. And funnily enough, it is Nouvellet's final ascension voice line that seems to prove this. Now, don't worry, I'm not committing a circular reasoning fallacy here. I'm not trying to prove that the voice line is true through the voice line. Instead, I'm asking you to pay attention to all the context. It's not just this line that implies that Nouvellet will recover his power or even that he will wage war against Celestia. It's his trailer, it's Teapot voice lines, it's Tainsleaf and Nibelung and all of Conria. It's even before Sun and Moon. So today, I will be attempting to answer the question. Will the dragons rise again? And if so, how? So let's start with Nouvellet's Teapot voice lines, shall we? Because oh boy, does the plot thicken! Pay attention to any weird word choice on his part, okay? If you mean what I would like to do right now, I think I would enjoy taking a nice walk. But if you're asking about the long term, then I would want all life to be able to live on in the original forms that are rightfully theirs. It's merely that, as of now, even existence in such a natural state must be fought for most fiercely. You are right. I, I am saying that more for myself to hear than anything else. If you too find yourself subject to grave injustice, yet bound by rules that are twisted and warped, you must be willing to step up and right those wrongs. If you cannot break free from the eggshell, the world is not but a prison where you are blinded and confined. Do not be afraid of bleak desolation and poverty outside the prison, and do not fret about your stable rations being cut off once the prison is destroyed. Outside that world, I will always be waiting for you. Did you notice it? Nouvellet said that we are all stuck in an eggshell. Why is that relevant? Remember the infamous before sun and moon. It is filled with the consistencies and weird descriptions that are just now beginning to make sense, and this is one of them. 
It states that a primordial one, who may have been Fanes, was birthed from an egg. Later, it used the eggshell to separate the microcosm of the world from the rest of the universe. We have known for a very long time that there is a hidden truth to Devat, and we have known for equally as long, thanks Karamush, that it has something to do with the sky. The stars are fake after all, and there is something going on with the moons. From here, most people got to the natural conclusion that Tevat must be contained within some kind of dome, some kind of eggshell. One that Nouvellet compares to a prison and one he actively encourages the traveler to escape from. This actually also tackles an inconsistency in Before Sun and Moon's narrative. The stone tablet states that the primordial one, along with one of its shades, created all life, from plants to the beasts of the land, sea and air, which we know isn't the case. The Ramurians believed that the Primordial Sea was a source of all life. As it turns out, they were right. According to the wings of merciful, wrathful waters, the shade used the sea to give rise to new life forms. So technically, the sea is the origin of all life. But the shade and the Primordial One, despite coming up with the design, cannot be credited with the creation of everything before Sun and Moon claims. The description of this very glider speaks of life emerging during the rule of the original Hydra Dragon, so even before Celestia came knocking. And we know that the Seven Nations already existed much as they are now before Fanes. For instance, Sumeru already had a lush rainforest. So something is not adding up here. Which is why Nouvellet's voice line is so intriguing. Especially when it says, I'd want all life to be able to live on in the original forms that are rightfully theirs. I'm of two minds here. The description of this same glider makes a point to tell us that Egeria was made completely out of elements of Tevatian origin despite being a creation of the ruler of humans, aka the Primordial One. The Celestial Gods, being aliens, are naturally made out of, well, alien elements. But the way this was worded makes it seem like all of its creations are, by default, also alien, with Egeria being the sole exception. So, this could be what Nouvellet was referring to, as in, all this new life that was created does not possess the rightful Tevatian form. I don't think that is it, though, because Nouvellet is a wonderfully complex character. He lives among the creations of those who stole everything from him, and yet he has learned to care for humans, perhaps even to love them. After all, does he not cry when faced with their pain? If humanity is, by definition, an invasive species, it sounds like it could be advocating for their removal, but I can't see the Udex doing that. Moreover, he loves the Melusines, but they were birthed from the corpse of one of Rhine Daughter's abyssal creations, so they aren't exactly native either. The second option is that the Tevat we know is fake. We already know that the sky is fake, but have you wondered at its purpose? What does a dome do other than keeping things in or keeping things out? In this case, it's probably both because Nouvellet tells the Traveler to seek him out should they break out of prison, aka Tevat, which means that there needs to be a world outside of the one we have been traveling, perhaps the original world the dragons inhabited, whether that be the Light Realm or something else, like the real Tevat. Because what if this one is just a dream? <laughs> this is a shameless self-plug, by the way, but that's a relevant theory for the point at hand, okay? And I don't have the time to explore it in this video, so go watch it if you want. Or don't, I can't make you. Anyway, this teapot voice lines really put the last scene of his trailer into perspective. In it, we can see the sky crack as it says that this is merely the prelude to what is to come. And if that is not foreshadowing, I don't know what is. To me, it sounds like the dragons are making a comeback. So when you add all of this to the voice lines, it makes it seem like he plans to shatter the eggshell to destroy this warped and twisted fake world of the Primordial One's making in order to restore life to his original form, which is in line with him being the Hydra Sovereign, what with the OG being the first heart of the Primordial Sea in creating said original life. Speaking of the original Hydra Sovereign, though, I will say that the teapot voice lines probably take place after the final Ascension 1 and, in a way, even lend some credence to it. You see, Nouvellet remembers the Primordial Sea, but he does not remember all about it. He does not possess all of the memories of his previous incarnation. Not at present, at least. But according to these voice lines, he's likely going to get them back. And what better way to go about it than recovering his lost authority? You see, way back during Mondstadt's chapter, Venti told us that the noses and visions were similar, even if the latter is a more primitive form of the former. So they should work in a similar way, right? 
and it just so happens that visions store memories. That's the whole reason why the Traveler was able to dream about Child and his misadventures in the Fortress of Meripid. So the Gnosis should also be capable of storing memories, which actually would explain why Scaramouche cried when housing the Electro-Gnosis immediately after his creation. So for Nuvolet to suddenly have all this knowledge about the Dragon War and everything that came before, he must have recovered the Hydro-Gnosis. So yeah, I am very convinced that the events narrated in his voice line will come to pass. But that is not all. Even if Nuvolet gets his full power back, so what? He can't really do much on his own, but like I said, I believe the dragons, with an S, are coming back for round 2. And the reason why is Conria and a 15 hour long German opera. Have you ever noticed that we have an extra dragon? No, seriously, think about it. Before Sun and Moon talks about the seven dragon sovereigns that ruled over the seven nations, but a pep told us that there is a dragon king, Nibelung. However, we have never been told about one element being more powerful than the rest, and as the king, he would expect Nibelung to be the strongest dragon. Makes sense, right? So, he shouldn't possess any of the seven Tivatian elements, or rather, he should possess all of them. There is a lot of evidence currently in the game to support the existence of this hypothetical element the lore community has taken to unofficially calling the Light Element. Meaning, Nibelung could be this hypothetical Light Dragon but he's still missing two things that all the other sovereigns possessed. A nation to rule and an authority. Enter Conria, a godless nation and one that was fiercely proud of that fact. But dragons aren't gods and the fallen nation's goals are strangely lined up with Nibelung's. Alright, let's backtrack a little. Conria knew that something was off about Celestia. They renounced divine guidance, took in those who left the lands of the Seven and were after before Sun and Moon even before what Tatsumi came to be. But at that point, we have no indication that Celestia posed a threat to them. The rough timeline we can put together, as of now, makes it seem like they played the round and found out with the Abyss, and only then did the Celestial Gods step in, since they seem to be deathly afraid of forbidden knowledge, which is just a form of abyssal power. So why did they need the Abyss twin pre-Cataclysm? There is something that Clothar said that has never quite made sense in my mind. We once believed that you would bring new strength and hope to Conria. To us, you were the Abyss. A wondrous mystery far beyond our imagination and comprehension. And the one who controls the Abyss can control everything. What does he mean by new strength and hope? Conria was a very powerful nation at its peak, and again, one that didn't seem to be in trouble. So why did they need this new strength? That is, perhaps, explained by the ending of the line I played. The one who controls Ives controls everything. Now, where have I heard that reasoning before? When the dragons were losing the war against the Usurper, the Dragon King ventured into the Abyss to obtain the power of Forbidden Knowledge, believing that that was the key to defeating the Primordial One. This was a last resort kind of thing, because we know how destructive the power of the Abyss is, especially to creatures from the Light Realm such as dragons. But despite that, Apep doubled down on it and kept on trying to acquire Forbidden Knowledge even after Nibelung's death, so this seems to be the dragon's last hope and Conria seems to be in much the same situation. The Abyss is obviously destructive to them, so the reason why the Twin was so important to them is because they were seemingly capable of wielding the power of the Void Realm without consequence. In other words, Conria wasn't after defensive power, they were preparing to rekindle an old war, the Dragon War. But this time they meant the perfect Nibelung's plan. And they were following in its, uh, Paul steps? Because they are its people. Here's the thing. I'm not entirely sure the Conrians are human, at least not fully. If you have been around for long enough to remember Tsumi, congratulations, you are a fossil. Anyway, Tsumi is believed to be the last descendant of the vassals of Watatsumi, the half-serpent, half-human familiars of Orobashi who have, over time, taken on a more human-like appearance, being that the only way to tell them apart from regular humans are their vertical pupils. However, Enju claims that she is a Visha person a race of highly intelligent and fast-evolving baptismal bishops. So, essentially, a bishop in human skin with weird eyes. 
I'd like to add that we currently aren't sure if Visha people are even something that actually exists. After all, our only source is Enju, and he's not exactly peer-reviewed. But their hypothetical existence could mean something very interesting for Conria. After all, what sets them apart from everyone else is their pupils. Granted, theirs are more primogem-shaped than snake-like. At the end of the day, characters like Baiju or even Shongyun fit the description better. But since this is a nationwide trait, I'm not willing to write it off yet. Okay, you say, but them following Nibelung's stride and false method and having a peculiar eyes is not definitive proof of their connection to the Dragon King. What is, though, is the Ring of Nibelung and Opera. Hyunjin has taken so much inspiration from it that its references go beyond the scope of Conria, but since it is extremely long, I'll be summarizing only the parts that matter to this video. So, let me set the scene. The opera is inspired by German and Norse legends, and in this context, Nibelung refers to a race of dwarves. And among them, there was a particular one named Alvrik. Now, Alvrik was something of a greedy fella. So, he went to the river Rhine, where the three Rhine maidens, also known as Rhine daughters, kept their hoard of gold. There, he sold their treasure and used it to craft the ring. This was no ordinary ring, though, as it possessed magical properties and granted the power to rule the world. Meanwhile, the gods decided they wanted to live in a new palace, Valhalla, which is being built by the giants Fafnir and Fasolt. As payment for their work, Wotan, the Germanic counterpart of Odin, promised to hand over the goddess Freya. But his wife, Frika, was like, yeah, we are not doing that. So Wotan had to find another form of payment, and what could possibly be a finer gift than Alberic's magical ring? The only problem was that Alberic was not keen on handing it over. So the gods tricked him into imprisonment and demanded the ring in exchange for his freedom. Alvaric reluctantly agrees, but being the petty character that he is, he curses the ring first. At this point, the ring becomes something of a prophecy, meant to bring about the destruction of the gods. Wotan is then counseled to hand over the ring to the giants, as was the original plan. Because who wants a cursed ring? The giants take it, and the curse immediately takes effect, resulting in Fafnir slaying Fasolt over this piece of jewelry. You would think that would be enough to convince the gods they wanted nothing to do with Alvaric's ring? But in true the One Ring fashion, Wotan is obsessed and he puts in motion a plan that spans several generations of mortals to get it back. Eventually, one of his mortal descendants slays a giant Fafnir, who had taken on the form of a dragon, and retrieves the ring. But immediately after, we get the whole lot more betrayal with a side of backstabbing. The ring changes hands a couple more times, but by the end of the opera, the Rhine Maidens finally get it back, but not before the gods have been destroyed and Valhalla has burned down. <sighs> okay, so we have a lot of names in common with Conria, right? From our Rhine daughter, also known as Gold, that mirrors the Rhine Maidens and they are gold, to Ulrich, which was a surname of the Regian clan before the Cataclysm, who also founded the Abyss Order. So, there's likely some corruption going on there, and wouldn't you know it, the opera Alvaric was also corrupt as he enslaved the rest of the Nibelung and forced them to mine for gold. There is also a bunch of connections between Wotan slash Odin and Ermin, but that's besides the point. So, we now have something that is at least linking the name Nibelung to Conria. And not only that, but it also reveals our missing authority. During Nahida's second story quest, Abeb says this, in war, the victor would inherit the right to shape the world, while the losers must turn to ash. Before Sun and Moon tells us of the primordial one creating the current Devat, because it inherited the right to shape the world through its battle with the dragons. And what did it get out of this war? The Gnosis. The true power of a dragon's authority isn't elemental manipulation. The Gnosis likely have the ability to alter the fabric of reality itself. That's why Celestia needs them and why Nahida believes heavenly principles would act if one of the noses were to be destroyed, because they need all seven to keep this warped world of theirs going. And if Nuvolet is going to recover his authority, would that not give us a very convenient explanation as to why the sky is cracking now? But like I said, going off the assumption that Nibelung is the eighth dragon, it should also possess an authority. And in the opera, Alvaric the Nibelung has his ring. Nibelung's ring. One that grants the wielder the power to rule over the world, just like how our draconic Nibelung likely ruled over the sovereigns, which in turn ruled over all seven nations. This ring is probably the most powerful of the authorities, and we know that it exists in-game. 
Zurvan, the first Barry, met Dainsleaf during the Cataclysm and remembers he was clutching a ring tightly. This is Nibelung's ring. Dane is one of those on-the-nose characters because his constellation is literally called Snake Ring. Keep in mind that Genshin kind of uses snakes and dragons interchangeably and dragons can have very varied appearances. Besides, we know that at some point, Dane wished to take fate into his own hands, so he likely needed a large amount of power to do so. And here he is, facing off monsters during the Cataclysm, with mayhem everywhere, but he's still holding on tight to that ring, prioritizing its protection. It's gotta be important, right? And here's the thing. The seedling met Clothar perhaps a couple hundred years after the Cataclysm, and he was already kind of cuckoo back then due to the erosion he was experiencing. But Dane is over 500 years old now, and he doesn't show a lot of symptoms. Zurvan even commented that, despite half his body having become that of a monster, he didn't feel monstrous. It's entirely possible that being in possession of the Ring of Nibelung is halting the effects of the curse. If you think about it, the Light and Void realms are polar opposites, so this authority could be keeping the Abyssal energy at bay. But, most importantly, if this is Nibelung's ring, we may already know how Dainsleaf betrayed the Abyss Twin and his fallen nation. Surely the Abyss Prince or Princess doesn't consider him a traitor for being unable to lead Conway to victory when they themselves could not. But, if the Abyss Order is following in Nibelung's footsteps, they would probably want to bring him back. Dragons can reincarnate, after all. And if they, if they didn't, the Authority would likely still be a key piece in their plan. So, a certain Twilight Sword, who did not agree with the direction Kanri was headed in, would only need to steal the ring to derail their plans, thus betraying the Order. But, all of this is to say that Nuvolet is not alone. If the Abyss Order is following Nibelung, they will probably side with him. Heck, even Dainsleaf talks positively about the Udex. And if he has the ring, well, that ring is prophesied to be the doom of the gods. There is also Peb who is just biding her time, as well as the other five sovereigns that are currently MIA. There may even be the Tsaritsa. I keep going back to Peb's line, in war, the victor would inherit the right to shape the world, while the losers must turn to ash. This reminds me of the Tsaritsa's desire to burn away the old world. She doesn't like Celestia and is in the process of collecting the noses, the very things that can put Tevat on creative mode and perhaps shatter the eggshell. We don't know what her end goal is, but as of right now, Furin is confirmed to have a vision and the Hydra Noses has to go somewhere. If that somewhere is Nouvellet, I am very much looking forward to the way the Harbingers will react, as that could clue us into what the Cryo Archon is really cooking. Okay, that was a lot. There's a lot going on with Nuvolet, but I do firmly believe that it will stand by his word and actually get something done, and Celestia may just be in trouble. But let me know what you think. Is this voice line real or should we not believe it? And are you excited for the new version that is just about to drop? The trailer was really great, and I know that I am looking forward to it. Anyway, do let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. My name is Blue, and I'll see you again soon. Safe journey, travelers!